subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go hello and welcome to rao's ias dns session we are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper the hindu delhi edition dated 2nd june 2022 we shall pick up only those articles relevant to civil service examination and we shall discuss them as per the demand of the exam before we begin there is an important announcement for you we have uploaded today a new question from the dns as part of our DNS answer writing practice series. To draw maximum benefit out of these DNS sessions, you need to sit down, take piece of paper, write answers and get a review on that. This DNS answer writing series program is an opportunity for you to get the feedback from the faculties at Rouse IAS. I would encourage you to sit down and write answer to this question, take a nice snapshot and in the portrait mode, please upload the answers. If you do it by tomorrow, you'll get a feedback from the team. There is an article on page number 10, Center to hold sessions on gig workers' rights. See, when the session will be held, then we'll come to know as to what has been proposed and formulated there for the gig workers' rights. But for now, we'll have a very general discussion on gig economy. Gig economy, as you would understand, refers to a form of economy in which organization employ only contractual non-permanent employees instead of permanent employees. This is one of the basic fundamental definition of gig economy. The gig economy workers, however, can range across the spectrum of profession, from highly paid to below minimum wage. And this especially is true for advanced Western countries, where the firms hire contractual workers on short-term basis. For example, when the establishment of factory is in the project phase, in the initial phase, they can hire very skillful architects. They can also hire some environmental law expert, but once they have the license, when they have the building up and running, they can dispense off these experts. Gig economy in India is poised to dominate in the coming years. The gig economy can serve up to 90 million jobs, which accounts for roughly 30% of India's non-farm workforce. This estimation is for the year of 2025. There's one crucial difference in normal employment and employment under gig economy. In case of ordinary employer-employee relationship, the employer can dictate as to when, where and how the work is to be carried out. But in gig economy, workers have complete control over these aspects, of course subjected to the larger, broader terms of contract. Workers have greater autonomy over the work. They have to just yield result, complete the work in the stipulated time. But the flexibility is more. That's only one reason as to why gig economy is growing. But the reason why it is becoming very popular in developing countries, especially in India, is largely because of rapid growth in the digital communication. Advancement and more coverage in digital communication has allowed the workforce to become highly mobile. They can work from anywhere without any hindrance from the geographical barriers. Gig economy also reduces the operating cost of the firm because the companies are not liable to pay pension and any other social security benefits. Workers, of course, have flexibility. They can switch jobs very easily. There is no notice period. They can choose the work according to their skill and their likings. There's also a push factor for the development of gig economy that has been recent slowdown in the formal employment creation because of COVID-19, but it did happen even before the COVID pandemic broke. Gig economy is poised to develop in the coming years and it will dominate the economy in the next decade. So the government also has woken up to the reality of existence and dominance of gig economy. The Code on Social Security 2020, it provides for the registration of all the gig workers and all the gig platforms. It calls upon the central and the state governments to formulate schemes to ensure social security benefits such as insurance for the gig workers. It also empowers the government to set up social security fund for the benefit of gig workers. The contribution to these funds may come from the center, state and the aggregator platforms. But nothing much has happened on this concept that is provisioned in the Code of Social Security 2020. There are many concerns regarding the rights of gig workers. First of all, there is no guaranteed benefit to gig workers. The industrial workers are automatically guaranteed social security benefits, such as provident fund, insurance, even maternity benefits. However, such benefits are not automatically extended to gig workers. The central and the state governments are required to come up with schemes to provide for these benefits. 
So the social security benefits for gig workers depend upon the political will of the government. Because of the informal nature, there is no guaranteed benefit automatically and also there is no guaranteed contribution from the aggregator. The code on social security that we just talked about mandates the industries employing workers above a certain threshold to compulsorily contribute towards social security benefits like provident fund and insurance. However, as far as gig workers are concerned, the language of the code does not provide for such compulsory contribution by the aggregators. Hence, it is left open to the government whether to seek contribution from the aggregator platforms or not. So it's not a matter of right that the aggregators must contribute for the social security of the workers. Similarly, the industrial workers are given legal rights over the various aspects of workers such as payment of minimum wage, safe working condition, or the right to strike, right to form trade unions, etc. All these are legal rights. However, such rights are not recognized in case of gig workers. There are also absence of some labor rights. For example, the gig workers may be asked to wear a particular kind of uniforms. They may not also choose the order of their task. For example, you must be very familiar with the idea that the Zomato Swiggy delivery partners or the Uber Ola drivers, they do not choose the ride. It is allotted to them. But then it is true that the work that you do in formal employment is also allotted to you by the superiors. It is often said that the gig workers enjoy a high level of freedom and flexibility in their work. However, these advantages get overshadowed by their higher dependence on the platform. The control of the platform on the workers the employees is very high. For instance, if a person wants to work as a cab driver or a food delivery partner, he needs to own a vehicle. Since poor people do not have access to loans, they come to be dependent on the platforms for the loans provided by them. This in turn reduces the flexibility associated with the gig economy. The workers would have to work according to the needs and requirements of the platform companies then. So if you have to talk about the rights of gig workers, you can categorize the rights according to this and structure your answer properly. There is an article on page number 10. Government allows cooperatives to sell products online. Rather, the news should be that the government has allowed cooperatives to buy products online. Because under the government e-marketplace, so far the procurement buying activity was done only by government agencies. The central government, the state government, various ministries, departments and public sector units. The private players cannot buy on the government e-marketplace. However, they can sell. But now, apart from the government agencies, the cooperatives also have been allowed to procure goods and services through the government e-marketplace. Government e-marketplace was launched in 2016 by Ministry of Commerce and Industry, which is also the nodal ministry for the platform. The purpose was to create an open and transparent procurement platform for government buyers. So that there is an economy of a scale, there's also efficiency in the costing. Presently, the government e-marketplace is used for common goods and services used by government agencies. Since the government e-marketplace is already adequately developed as one-stop portal to facilitate online procurement of common use goods and services, and it is also transparent, efficient, and already has economy of scale in speedy procurement, the cooperative societies now can benefit from this procurement of goods and services from the government e-marketplace. There are around 8.5 lakh registered cooperatives. So the move of allowing these cooperatives to procure through government e-marketplace will benefit around 27 crore people. It will give more bias to MSME industries, boosting the prospect of vocal for local and ultimately the larger idea of Atam Nirbhar Bharat. The cooperatives themselves can become more competitive from this more competitive platform by getting the goods and services at competitive prices. The government through the nodal agency will also do handholding of cooperatives, welcoming them on board, giving them technical assistance to operate on the platform and also give them adequate training for their future transaction journey online on government e-marketplace. Now taking this opportunity, let's also have some basic discussion on cooperative societies. Cooperatives, first of all, are voluntary associations. People come together on voluntary basis to promote their economic interest. So this voluntary association is based on mutual cooperation. The idea is the members will get benefited by mutual cooperation. 
The welfare of one is in the welfare of all. The members pool their resources, utilize them in the best possible manner and derive some common benefit out of it. So the capital contribution comes from the members. They together can take some credit, that is okay. But initially they come together to pool their resource and they themselves create the credit. It has open membership. The management is done in the democratic manner. But since the interest of people are involved and this is a kind of open membership body, so there would be an oversight and regulation by the state. The fundamental working principle and the idea of business through cooperative is same for all kind of cooperatives. But different cooperatives differ in the kind of activities that they take. Cooperatives can be formed as marketing society. These societies are formed by small producers and manufacturers who find it difficult to sell their products individually. So the society collects the products from individual members and takes the responsibility of selling these products in the market. For example, the Gujarat Cooperative Milk Marketing Federation that does the selling and marketing for Amul. Cooperative societies in general can be formed for producers. These societies are formed to protect the interest of small producers by making available the items of their need for production, for example, raw materials, tools and equipments, machinery, etc. Handloom societies like Apecco, Haryana Handloom. There is a producer cooperative society by the name of Bayanika. Cooperative societies can also be formed for consumers. These societies are formed to protect the interest of general consumers by making consumer goods available at reasonable price. The society for consumers buy the goods directly from the producer or the manufacturers and thereby they eliminate the middlemen in the process of distribution. You might have heard of a cooperative called as Apna Bazaar. There are other consumers cooperative societies like Kendriya Bhandar, Sahakari Bhandar. They can also be housing cooperative society. These societies are formed to provide residential houses to members. The society as a whole purchase land, develop it and construct houses or flats and allocate the same to members. Some societies also provide loans at low interest rate to members to construct their own houses. There are many metropolitan housing cooperative societies in many metropolitan cities. In cooperative credit society, financial support is given to the members. The society accepts deposit from members and grants them as loans at reasonable interest rate in times of need. Primary agriculture credit societies and urban cooperative banks. They are actually cooperatives. Cooperative farming societies are formed generally by small farmers to work jointly and thereby enjoy the benefits of large-scale farming. You must have heard of Pani Panchayats. You might also have heard of Lift Irrigation Cooperative Societies. Cooperatives brings lots of benefit to the members and to society in general. Cooperative societies can create employment opportunities in rural area for rural people. For example, Amul Cooperative Movement has created an alternate employment opportunity. It has set up a model of rural employment generation, rural prosperity and balanced regional growth. Cooperatives also help in financial inclusion. Many rural farmers can access the financial intermediary services otherwise provided by financial institutions like loans and deposits through rural credit cooperative societies. According to Nabard annual report, the state cooperative banks dispersed a total of Rs. 1,48,625 crore in loan in the financial year 1920. Cooperative societies also help the cause of women empowerment or gender justice. Cooperative societies have played a major role in not only providing employment opportunities but also improving the socio-economic status of women in society. For example, the very famous Sri Mahila Gri Udyog, the one that produces very famous Lijjat Papad. This cooperative society is a classic example for women empowerment. Cooperative societies, as we understand, works on the principle of open membership and democratic control. So they penetrate the democratic values, people's participation, direct accountability to the grassroots level. Cooperative societies also improve the competitiveness of goods and services provided. As we have discussed previously, in the consumers' cooperative societies and also in the producers' cooperative societies, the members control the supply chain. 
the middlemen are eliminated this obviously reduces this obviously reduces the final price of the output the benefit of cooperative societies is huge but still very few cooperative society movements have been successful rest of them have crippled down the reason is cooperatives are reeling with many challenges first and foremost there is limitation of capital the members of the cooperative societies are from low income group they cannot take credit at high interest rate because they work mostly on non profit motive assistance from government in terms of credit dispersal is at par with other industries and other sectors there is no much special assistance given to the cooperative sector then there is issue with the managerial skill of the office bearers of these cooperatives since the motive is non profit there is not much incentive for people with expertise to hold the office of the cooperatives as we have discussed before cooperatives are under the regulation of government specifically state government so far so there are political interferences and corruption in the management of cooperatives the crisis in punjab and maharashtra cooperative bank is one of the recent example in this regard to form cooperative societies in india is a fundamental right guaranteed by the constitution cooperative society has been mentioned in the seventh schedule in the second list cooperative societies is a state subject various state governments have their own cooperative societies act and cooperative societies are registered as societies under those acts the state governments have an office of registrar of societies this office regulates the state cooperative societies but there are certain societies that are operative in multiple states the multi state cooperative societies are hence governed by the central registrar of societies but if the cooperative society is involved in the banking function and is acting as a cooperative bank then that is regulated by rbi under the provision of banking regulation act 1949 the underperformance corruption inefficiency of cooperative societies have been the feature as long as the concept has been developed and materialized in india government of india constituted vaidyanath committee to suggest reform in cooperative societies and the committee suggested recapitalization of cooperatives the committee suggested strong institutional reforms with regard to capacity building with regard to management it also suggested better managerial practices common accounting system throughout the cooperatives computerization of cooperatives working on the idea of recapitalization or better credit facility availability to the cooperatives government of india has formed two funds under nabard they are called as short term cooperative rural credit fund and long term rural credit fund government of india has very actively promoted and recently taken a lot of measures to promote farmer producer organization in the budget of 2019-20 government of india has set up the target of setting 10000 farmer producer organizations in next 5 years government also brought the banking regulation amendment act 2020 to bring urban cooperatives directly under the control of rbi and now the government of india has taken the bold step of setting ministry of cooperation to help improve the condition of cooperatives in india there is a news article on page number 8 the european union's ban on russian oil see ever since russia started the war against ukraine the west european countries along with us have started imposing economic sanctions on russia however one of the contentious issue in the sanction was the sanction by european countries on oil import from russia since europe was heavily dependent on the import of oil and gas from russia Initially these countries including Germany hesitated from imposing ban on the Russian oil imports primarily because these countries have been facing economic challenges post covid-19 pandemic but now the european countries have decided to impose a ban on russian oil imports in this context let us understand the rational consequences and the exemptions provided by these sanctions see european union recently have reached on a consensus to ban 90% of russian crude oil imports by, by the end of the year it is russian crude oil it is not the gas but even in the crude oil exemptions have been provided for example hungary and other landlocked countries like czech republic slovakia they had concerns regarding ban on the crude oil import from russia because they are landlocked countries and they are heavily dependent on the russian pipeline oil 
and they do not have any readily available alternative source, especially in the context of absence of ports. But the ban now has been announced and the announcement has immediately resulted in the surge of oil prices. But the real question is how much and for how long these sanctions can impose burden on Russian economy. The Russian economy is of course heavily dependent on energy exports and European Union pays billions of dollars every month to Russia for the crude oil and refined products. It is estimated that even a two-third cut in the Europe's import of Russian oil would mean a reduction of 1.2 to 1.5 million barrels a day. That will amount to a total annual loss to Russia of $10 billion. Russia does not have a good storage infrastructure for the crude oil. So these cutbacks from the European market would force Russia to find other markets. Maybe China, maybe India, maybe elsewhere. So either the Russia would have to look for new buyer or it has to do cuts in production. But these immediate problem imposed to the Russian economy, how much will that affect the Russian military operation in Ukraine is not very clear. Because the sanctions are on Russian crude oil and even the pipeline oil to some countries have been exempted from it. But the Europe's dependence on Russian gas is much greater and this sanction leaves Russian gas altogether. Russian gas accounts for 40% of Europe's natural gas import. But the gas has remained untouched. The sanction is only on crude oil. But however, crude is more expensive than natural gas. So the sanction will definitely hurt the Russian revenues. What is the stand of India in all of this? Well, you would already know that India actually increased the purchases of Russian crude at discounted price in the months following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And this policy is expected to continue. The announcement of European Union ban caused an immediate surge in the international oil prices. And as Europe seeks alternative sources, maybe from West Asia, Africa and elsewhere, the oil prices is expected to stay high. And in this scenario, Russia has reportedly offered discount of around 30 to 35 dollar per barrel. And India has found it very convenient to make the most of this cheap Russian crude oil offer. So we are going to increase our purchase from Russia and other and European countries know it. You must be reading in today's newspaper that the German ambassador has said that they do understand that the relation of India and Russia are pretty strong and that's how it's going to stay. There is a news article on page number one. Caste-based census to be held in Bihar. See the demand for caste-based census is being raised in states like Bihar and Karnataka. And for the coming mains examination, this topic becomes important. Let's look at the brief history of caste data in census in India. And then we'll come to the point as to should it be included in the census of 2021. The first synchronous census happened in 1881. Before 1881, census was conducted between 1865 to 1871. The data was released in 1872. But ever since 1881, census were conducted every 10 years in a synchronous manner meaning simultaneously in the entire country. But census data always had few queries, questions on caste. The purpose to include the data on caste was mischievous. The aim was to divide the society and conquer. However, properly socio-economic caste census was done in 1931. And this was the last time census had data on caste. In 1941, caste-based data were collected, but it was not published. So the era of caste-based data through census was over in 1931 itself. In 1941, the census commissioner said that the time is past for the enormous and costly table as part of central undertaking, meaning they were not to collect and release the caste-based data through census anymore. Perhaps the purpose was already fulfilled. The Union of India after independence decided as a matter of policy to not include the caste data population-wise other than that of SCs and STs. This stand of central government is unequivocally clear. Recently, Minister has said on the floor of Parliament that it is a matter of policy to not collect and release caste data through census other than that of SCs and STs. You know the percentage of SCs and STs in India, don't you? How do you know that? Because that is released through the census. So the question of collecting caste-based data is only for OBCs. For SC and ST, it is done already. This was the last one before independence. After independence, all the census that has been conducted since 1951 to 2011 
has published data on scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, but the largest caste block, the other backward classes, OBCs, data on them have not been collected and hence not released. So we do not have a proper estimate of OBCs and we don't at all have proper estimate of subgroups within OBCs. Things continued till 1979 when Mandel Commission, formerly called as Socially and Educationally Backward Classes Commission, suggested expansion of affirmative action, reservation, to include OBCs. But then the last updated data on caste or OBCs was that of 1931. And as per the census, 52% of Indian population were OBCs. But there were demands for detailed data collection of OBCs and subclasses within OBCs. Ten years after release of Mandal Commission in 1990, the VP Singh government decided to implement the Mandal report. Government introduced a new class, other backward classes, and 27% reservation were given to OBCs. But the demand was of greater reservation. But since the official numbers were not available in the updated form, this could not have been done very objectively. So since then, the demand always has been there to include OBC data in the decennial census. In 2010, UPA government decided to go for a full-fledged socio-economic caste census. However, after completion of the census, only economic data of urban and rural population were released. The caste-based data were withheld. There are various reasons for this. There were opposition by certain state also. There was not much confidence in the process of data collection. Now with the arrival of time for census of 2021, a fresh demand has appeared to include the caste data in the census. Let's talk about the benefit of doing a caste-based census. The last caste-based census was done in 1931. So a caste-based census now, after around 90 years, will do good in understanding the changes that has happened in our society. Because caste is a reality in Indian society. It's a way of life. We must know about our reality of existence. It will also do good to the cause of understanding changes that has happened in the society in last one century. Caste-based data will also help one understand the caste-based political decisions. And unnecessarily, all political decisions will not be muted as caste-based political decisions. Caste-based data will objectively identify the backward and downtrodden classes. Then government programs, schemes and policies can be directed better for these downtrodden classes. How will you follow the policy of unto the last, unto there? Unless you know the last person in the society, the most downtrodden class. Indian government actually runs many programs based on caste. There are various schemes and initiatives for backward classes. So it's paradoxical that the central government has a stated policy stance of not collecting and releasing caste-based data. Caste-based data will also touch upon the elephant in the room, reservation policy. It will help rationalize it. We have various evidences to show that marginalization, backwardness, does not happen in few castes exclusively. It has been suggested by some data that because of rising rural wages, particularly construction wages, and social security schemes run by government, many Dalits and also many OBCs are now in better position. National sample survey data also shows that poverty persists among forward castes as well. National Council for Applied Economics conduct India Human Development Survey. According to the survey, 56% of Dalit children aged between 8 and 11 cannot read. But the same is true for 32% of forward castes and 47% of other backward classes. You cannot enforce the principle of equity unless you know the differences in the society. The 50% reservation cap that has been imposed by Supreme Court is also considered arbitrary because there is no data to back this up. Recently, people have been demanding reservation for their own community like Jats in Haryana, Marathas in Maharashtra, Kakpus in Andhra Pradesh, Gujars in Rajasthan, Patidas in Gujarat. All these reservation demands can either be met or rejected very objectively in a transparent manner if we have caste-based data. Also, within OBC, it's necessary to ensure equal representation. And that is why National Commission for Backward Classes has urged the government to collect data on various subclasses of OBC in the coming census. See, the question is, if it has so much of benefit, then why it is being opposed? 
why the central government does not accept it why the central government has a policy of not collecting caste based census data although the government has not given reason for this but the obvious answer one can think of is that it will strengthen the institution of caste in india not that we do not want the institution of caste but we do not want it to be developed in an exclusive manner we do not want caste to be seen as a homogeneous classifiable units where each unit is start competing with the other in social economic political sphere in an unhealthy competition the caste based politics that we see in india might further get promoted caste based politics in india is a reality last time you remember at the time of karnataka election the lingayat issue was raked up during election time in haryana the jat issues comes to the fore similarly in different region in india and different states different caste issues come to the fore at opportune time and historically we know the games that were being played using the caste data in the census it is also suggested by some that the anti brahmanical movement that started in the 20th century were based on these caste based census data so we do not understand very well the dynamics of caste based census that will play out in the society and that's why the hesitation is there but this is an unsettled issue in the indian polity and you must have an opinion as to what should be the way ahead think about it and put that in the comment section now you have on your screen question of the day for today and answer to yesterday's question of the day the question is pretty easy try to attempt it visualizing the map of europe and for more practice visit the elearn platform for the dns quiz goodbye take care